All right, so I'm presenting my work, uh, joint work with uh, my colleagues in the computer science department, more specifically the DIAS group, uh, Dee, Brandon, and my uh, advisor, Zhao Wei Han, on a multi arm bended approach to batch mode active learning on information networks. If any of these words are uh, foreign to you, we'll go over them individually in, in my presentation. Um, so first of all, what is active learning? So imagine a setting where you have a ton of unlabeled data, but it's really ex expensive to actually acquire a label. For example, if you're trying to figure out, you know, given a patient, what are the clinical outcome for a treatment or something of that nature, um, that's a very expensive process. So what we want to do is we want to maximize the utility of your label by selecting the most informative instances for labeling. Uh, so in this example, you're doing a fairly straightforward binary classification. Um, so say, you know, I'm, I'm only allowing you to take, you know, this is something like 20 labels, right? If you take a random sample, you get a classifier that's a lot less uh, accurate than if you were able to actually select something that's on the boundary. So does it work? Based on the example, yes. And we'll, show, we'll see later on that it also works in our setting. So a little more formally, what you're looking for is you're looking for the optimal set that allows you to uh, maximize your accuracy train on that optimal set. Right, so just um, here's the process of active learning. So you start with an unlabeled pool. Uh, you select some queries that are to be labeled by the oracle, usually a human annotator. And then um, you gather those labels and then you put them into your training set and you feed that into your learning algorithm. And sometimes you actually go back to your unlabeled pool. Once you've updated your algorithm and your uh, belief about how you would um, update your selection strategy, you go through this loop one more time uh, or multiple times until you know, some kind of convergence uh, criterion has been satisfied. Right, so now we want to think about active learning on networks. What you're seeing here is the canonical East network, um, where each node is a protein and they're linked by uh, interaction, some sort of interaction. Sometimes you know, a protein regulates another one. Uh, sometimes a protein promotes um, expression of another one, so on and so forth. Um, and what we, we want to classify the proteins by um, whether they are lethal to the organism if you knock them out. And as you can see, the class, um, patterns are very interdispersed, it's a lot harder for you to say, to draw a clear boundary between the different classes. So how do we go about you know, act, doing active learning on something that looks like this? Um, so first thing we did was we said, let's back off. Let's make less assumptions about how we construct the network and keep more information in our network. So in our previous example, we are actually already putting a lot of assumptions into the way we construct our network. We are saying, you know, these, um, Proteins are connected, are, are only connected if they have some kind of uh, interaction pattern. Whereas in the heterogeneous information network setting, uh, what we are doing here is we are allowing for different types of nodes as opposed to a homogeneous, you know, all protein or social network, all people. Um, so by doing this, we're actually able to capture more uh, finer granularity of semantic relations, for example. You know, in this made up example of, you know, review uh, network where, you know, circles are businesses and you have users that uh, review these um, businesses and then they, they are associated with some key terms from the reviews. Um, so if you're collapsing this onto a homogeneous network, you basically have to decide, okay, may, maybe two businesses are, are connected if a, a user has rated them both or so on and so forth. But here, we're actually uh, preserving more information by adding slightly more complexity into the way we express our network. Um, so now let's consider a task of classifying the businesses by whether user found it satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Um, so as you can see in this, this example, the two terms are key to uh, each of the classes. So if you know we are able to somehow figure out that if you, lab if you label these two guys, we can actually um, very quickly determine what the classes look like. And in the second example, say we're actually interested in classifying the business by their geolocation. Uh, in that example, the two users that, are, that are, have uh, frequented most of the business become the central player connecting all the different nodes. Uh, so in that setting, we want to figure out not only users are important, uh, users that have high between us are the most crucial to our uh, classification task. So based on these uh, observations, actually, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. So why do we want to do batch mode learning on networks? Um, in the 
um, IID setting, when you acquire a new label, you're adjusting the, uh, the hyperplane that actually covers the entire space, whereas in a network, when you are given a label for a node, really you can only reason about you know, a certain region of the network. So what you want to do is you want to cover not only all the classes, but the entire network as well. So that's our motivation for studying batch mode learning, meaning at each iteration, instead of picking a single, label, a single example of label, we pick um, a small batch of them instead. Right, um, so based on our previous two uh, synthetic examples, we have decided that uh, we have created something called primary learners. Uh, these are simple strategies that allows us to rank the nodes and figure out how to um, submit them for querying. Um, so the, the strategy that were created from uh, something called centrality measures, um, I know most people should be familiar with them, but if you're not, they're basically a way for you to assign importance to nodes in, uh, in a network based on some uh, structural um, importance definition. So our primary learners are basically ranking uh, the different nodes by type uh, based on some centrality measures. So for example, in that setting, we are ranking terms by, um, you know, by, by, by their betweenness, by closeness, or page rank, or degree, or something of that nature. So different types of nodes are important in the classification in different ways, which is why we consider multiple uh, centrality measures. Um, so here's an example of how different centrality measures induce different orderings on the graph. And um, also centrality measures have different ranges, even though um, they are supposed to be in the zero to one uh, range, but on average, uh, the close, uh, the betweenness of the entire graph is a lot lower than the closeness of the entire graph, and that becomes important later on. So multi-arm bandit, what is that? Real quick, um, what, what a bandit is, is really you have, you know, a bunch, it's a slot machine that has different arms, and each of the arm, you, at each um, time point, you can select one arm to play, and then you get some kind of payout. And then, you know, based on that payout, you decide which arm to pull next. Um, so in our example, in the first iteration, we pulled the first um, lever, we got a dollar. Second lever in the second um, iteration, we got, you know, 50 cents. And then the third one gave us two cents. And now we have some information about all of them. And now we have to figure out whether we want to exploit our current knowledge about the current best or we want to explore more about things that we're uncertain about. And it turned out that when we made a suboptimal play, we ended up actually increasing our expectation for, um, for our payout. So over there uh, on the far right, you're looking at the cumulative payout. And then the number in the red box is um, something that's called a regret. And what a regret is, you know, once uh, you have figured out the optimal arm, you know, which is number two in our case, and the expected payout for number two is 1.5. Had you known that the whole time, you would have wanted to play two in order to get an expected payout of $6. So your difference between uh, what you actually observed and what uh, you would have expected to have gotten paid if you knew the optimal strategy is the regret. And the name of the game in multi arm Bandit is to minimize that regret. So uh, how does active learning connect to multi arm Bandit? Um, we already introduced the primary learners and they are basically mapped onto the arms or the different machines in a multi arm Bandit. The label budget is the number of rounds that you are allowed to play in, in the multi arm Bandit game. Um, at each query, at each time in active learning, it's uh, corresponding to a play. And um, the reward that you receive in the multi arm bandit is corresponding to basically how much accuracy you can um, you, you can gain by uh, by receiving the label for a certain query, and then the overall um, reward would be, you know, given your training set, how much uh, how accurate can you train your model? And but we have a problem here. Without knowing the ground truth, these three quantities are not, actually not computable, and in the actual active learning setting, we don't have the ground truth. Therefore, we need some kind of approximation for these things. And the way we do that is by entropy reduction. Um, so the entropy of a node 
when I, is basically um, for your classifier, it has some belief about uh, the label distribution for a given node. For example, in our previous example, um, you know, you have a certain probability for unsatisfactory versus satisfactory, and you, uh, you, 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 you basically take the entropy of your current belief, and, and, and you see how much entropy you have uh, reduced given uh, from, the, from the previous round. And that's our reward, empirical reward for a given query. And for a query set, sorry, so um, you basically, sorry, for a given node, you look in its neighborhood and you figure out how much entropy reduction you have incurred in the entire neighborhood. Um, so for example, if you picked James Bond, you would want to look at James Bond and then all its immediate associates. Um, so the empirical reward for a query set, it's slightly uh, less, slightly more complicated than just taking a sum of all the queries. Um, say now you're, you're adding money pen to your query set. You actually really don't want to count M twice, even though, you know, w when you're doing a simple sum, you would actually count her twice, but when you're doing a union of the neighborhoods, um, you won't do that. And, and that's desirable because just because something is an intersection, it doesn't mean, you know, you're gaining more information on it. Um, so the empirical reward now for a primary learner is basically remember that the learners have um, some ideas about these are the good queries for this current round. And um, based and we can actually go back and look at the neighborhood of all these queries in order to figure out the reduction that that learner has incurred in the last round. And then we normalize it by the uh, entropy reduction over the entire network. And then we transform it into something that, that's in the zero one range. All right, so oops. All right, so now we are ready to talk about how you select query batches. So just for, 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 for a second, assume that you already know how to compute the expected reward for an expert. So, you know, given these expected rewards, you basically are saying, you know, for each expert, please give me your candidate set. And based on the union of the candidate set, I want to come up with a final set that gets submitted to the Oracle for labeling. And the way we do that is um, by wait, weighing, uh, weighting each of, the, uh, each of the experts by their vote for a given query. So for example, um, say the first expert is the degree expert by, um, by, by the term type. And what we're doing is we, we are waiting, uh, we're asking the, the expert to tell us what the actual degree for each of the node is, and then, and then we're weighing it, weighting it by the expert's um, expected reward uh, in the first um, voting scheme. In the second voting scheme, as I mentioned earlier, some of the centrality measures have very different ranges, and we don't want to uh, bias our, our learning algorithm to a given centrality measure simply because it has a higher range on average. So um, to counter that, we use the board of vote scheme where um, the absolute values of your votes don't matter. It only, it's a positional rank or it's a positional voting system where it, it only matters where you are in the rank list. So the guy at the top of the rank list of size three gets three votes and the second one gets two, so on and so forth. Um, so now the expected reward of a query set we're actually taking a simple sum of all the queries in there. So here we're making a really important assumption that for a certain node that lies in the neighborhood of two different nodes, um, the effect of labeling both nodes is actually additive. Um, that may not hold for some classification algorithms, but in experiments, it turned out to be an okay assumption. So now we go back and talk about how we actually compute the expected uh, expert reward. So um, mu hat is your um, empirical reward, and what we want to do is we want to uh, add in the second uncertainty term that basically says if, if we have explored it, you know, not enough times or fewer times than others, we want to um, bias our exploration scheme towards it. So once we have, you know, explored it multiple, multiple times and the mean is so low, we, we want to dismiss that. And the formula is, it's, it's um, created such that uh, you actually have a regret guarantee. 
Right. So um, remember we said earlier that a good query batch should have both network coverage and label class coverage. And the way we induce that is by further weighing the expected expert reward by two factors. The first factor uh, is the type bias. So imagine if you know a type has 20 nodes and then another type has a, a thousand a, a thousand nodes. Uh, three experts in the 20 node type would actually have a much higher likelihood of overlap than experts for the 1,000 node type. Um, so you don't want to um, assume that things in the 20 node type are more important um, simply because there's a higher chance of overlap. So we correct for that by uh, the probability of including something in a random sample of size p. And the second one is basically saying for each expert, what kind of label uh, distribution, what kind of entropy in the label distribution has it incurred in the current label set. And we basically want to bias towards experts that have queried for um, uniformly across the different labels. And if you know for a fact that you have a skew in, in your distribution, you can use the k algorithm instead. Um, so here's our algorithm putting everything together. Um, so at each round, you have a number, you're picking a B a queries, and first you do, you update your expected reward for each of the experts, and then you pick your batch based on the expected expert rewards and the other reward calculations that we just, we have shown. And then you update your label set, and then your unlabeled set, and then you update the counts for each of the experts based on how many of them actually got labels. And then you train your classifier on your label set, and then you use that outcome to update the, the empirical reward for your um, each of your experts. Right, so um, we ran some uh, experiments on our um, algorithm, and so we looked at two different data sets, uh, the DBLP data set containing paper author term and venue, and then the movie link data set con containing movie uh, actors, user, country, and tag. Um, where movies are connected to actors, movies are connected to users, countries, tags. Um, so in the first task, we wanted to classify by um, subject area. In the second one, we wanted to look at two different tasks on the same network. Um, so since we are the active learners, we're actually not doing the classification itself. So we chose two different uh, classification underlying classification algorithm to test our algorithm on top of the first one. Um, is designed for homogeneous networks, and the second one is designed for heterogeneous networks. And then we have a number of baselines from literature and heuristics. And then, as you can see, uh, we are the green in most of these guys. Um, we are either performing, uh, for in most cases, we are converging fairly quickly to the optimal in hindsight. Right, so in that um, particular example, it's very interesting that our um, algorithm way overperforms everyone else, that's because uh, we, we consider different types individually. And in that um, classification task, countries obviously are the most important for classifying films by whether it's domestic versus foreign. So that allows us to achieve a really, a really high performance very quickly. Um, so here's a simple case study on how our algorithm actually works internally. So here is the DBLP task by subject area. Um, we knew in hindsight that conferences by uh, page rank was the optimal strategy, but we began by assuming that conferences and authors are both valid strategies. Even though you see there that you know conferences are uh, papers are more important than conference uh, than authors, but authors had more overlap, which is why we actually uh, explored authors first, and then uh, we realized that you know quickly after a couple iterations that conferences are the best. Um, measures for uh, for submitting queries. And then uh, one interesting to see is that for the two um, other literature baselines, one of them selected mostly authors, and then you can see its performance is sort of in the middle, it's the red line, and then the, the far right um, algorithm, it was mainly selecting for papers and they had a really low performance. So that kind of tells us that um, papers had the lowest utility, and then authors, and then conferences, and that's exactly what our weights show after T4. Right, so in conclusion, we have shown 
and hack the learning strategy on heterogeneous information networks using the expected entropy reduction uh, technique. Uh, we use central centrality by type as our primary learners, but really you can have a range of different things um, for that particular component. Uh, we use batch mode learning via combinatorial multi-arm bandit. Uh, our algorithm is truly adaptive to different uh, classification paths on the same network. We are independent of the underlying classification model, and our performance is lower bounded by random because random was actually one of our um, primary learners. With that, I would like to take questions.